that's the uh, that's the theme of our Acts 1 8 conference. I, I would say that the Spirit of God leading Ben to sing that song and all the songs this morning, some of those old hymns and choruses, praise the Lord, for the blood of Jesus in Christ alone. I'll have to have Ben, if he can, sing that song during our conference. What a great message there in Christ, in Christ alone because of Christ. Do you have a handout? If you do not, raise your hand. And uh, we have a, a pair of ushers here. They're really, really fast. If you keep your hand up for a half an hour, they're going to find you, I promise. Keep on going, keep on going. Wow, you, that's he snuck up on you. That was good. We have a young man over here in the front. Don't forget the front people. You know, it's nice as a preacher to have people sitting in the front. Thank you very much for the first couple rows. Anybody that wants to come fill up the fr- No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But thank you, ushers, for helping us out. In Christ alone, you have now a, a little handout. I always wait till the Sunday before to make sure that you have something in front of you to grab your attention because it's only one week away. Let me make it simple. Here's the front. Turn over to the back. There you go. The front, there's the theme and the artwork, and that's... Uh, In Christ alone, Colossians chapter number 3, I mentioned that passage last week, went through a few slides. Now you have the uh, the in-the-hand product where you can put it in your Bible and since, yeah, you won't lose that, maybe on your refrigerator, we won't lose it there and there's plenty of them. But here on the back you have the schedule of the whole week. I just want to highlight one thing and that's Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will take care of themselves. I hope you can make it. Because each evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, of course, we'll be here at 7 p.m., but 6 o'clock in the coffee house. If you eat uh, desserts and coffee for dinner, like I do, and you'll be there, and it'll be good. Sometimes you just need a coffee and a brownie, and you're happy. There you go. You knew what I did there. Becky got it. Sunday morning, 9 a.m. and 10.30, Pastor George Grace will be preaching here. We call him Pastor George because that's all we always call him, Pastor Grace. He is now the director of the Bible Institute of First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester. Uh, he has, uh, uh, was a senior pastor for 30-plus years there. He teaches in the Bible Institute. We have him, uh, not live, but on video on Monday nights, every Monday night. He's been doing that for eight semesters in our Bible Institute, so he is part of that. Of course, he has been a great friend of our ministry over many, many years, and uh, he brings a great deal of credibility and a great deal of experience and Holy Spirit-led teaching. You will not be disappointed at what God has given him to speak, and he will speak it not eloquently, he'll speak it correctly, and he'll speak it by the Spirit for what we need as a church. And I'm uh, counting on that, just like Steve Kern last year and all the years in the past, 9 o'clock and 10.30 in the fellowship hall. We always have our Sunday groups meeting, our classes, everything. Well, 9 o'clock and 10.30 this coming Sunday, they will not be meeting regularly, but you will be meeting because there will be missionary Sean Vance. He'll be here with his family. He will be preaching the Word of God on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And then at 10.30, Mario, Pastor Mario Del Valle, who is the pastor at Mexico City. Sean Vance is in Uh, Kenya is a missionary there. He is, of course, overseeing many works there, but he's going to give us an update on Monday in our coffee house, but Sunday he's going to preach the Word of God, and so is it Mario. Mario will also be here Wednesday, flying in Wednesday. We have our Wednesday night testimony night, and that will be Mexico City mission team. Uh, The mission trip team will be in here. Please come and be part of that. It'll kind of get you all fired up for the Acts 1-8 conference. We, of course, will be having our Bible Institute class that evening, but you come on in here and enjoy the time of hearing the testimony of what the Lord did in Mexico City in the lives of the people there. It'll be really good to have Mario also, too, share his heart a little bit on Wednesday evening. Make sure you come Oaxaca uh, mission trip team. We had a great time this past Wednesday, and if you missed that, it's on, uh, it's on I believe, on Facebook recorded, and it's up on our YouTube channel as well to go listen to some of the testimonies that we uh, partook in. So there is 
in Christ alone, our Acts 1A conference. You also have on your seats in front of you, around you somewhere, uh, some commitment cards. I'll go into that a little bit more next Sunday for a few minutes and introduce that, and I will speak of that through the rest of the year because I always uh, put that out in front of you, but then that special offering will be something that will take up the balance of this year for 2023. And also, too, we will talk about our missions and how your support of missions has been strong throughout the whole year, through the last few years, and we are supporting missionaries regularly in a commitment of $7,700 a month, monthly support, plus all of your special designated offerings, which bump it up another two or three or $4,000 a month. So God has allowed us to give uh, about $120,000 to $130,000 a year in missions over the last two or three years, which I praise the Lord for that and give him the glory that is above, that is 10% and above 10% of our regular offering. So to me, that's powerful. And you want to be in a place as a church where you're supporting missions as if it were a tithe. It was, okay, God, you gave us all this money. Okay, we give you a tenth of it because it's just being a good steward. Because that means that we don't need it. <laughs> we could keep it ourselves, but... God says, I gave it to you so that you can give it back. And I gave you all that I've given you so that you give it back. We'll cover that in the book of Corinthians here sometime down the road. Paul covers that one as well. Join me in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. As we walk through the scriptures, our last time and the last message, of course, for the month of September. The next Sunday we get together will be the Acts 1A conference. It's October 1. So here we are. In Acts chapter number 6. Of course, as you again have listened over the last few weeks, coming back from being away, we dug right back in. And uh, we've been into some good stuff. Ending up and finished up chapter number 4. Got into chapter number 5. Chapter number 6, the first half last week. And uh, this is some tough ground. But this is where God led us to teach. And led us to preach. And led us to study the word of God on a weekly basis every Sunday morning. Love never fails. That is our theme verse and our theme statement for the study of this book. And it comes out in so many ways, just not 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, which all is the spoken of, the charity chapter, that it speaks of G26. It speaks of that, speaks of that agape love, the love that is that charity love that gives without any conditions tied to it. It's that kind of love that God pours out, and we realize that God's love never fails. It's, that's the kind of love that we need to have. The believer us to understand that. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You have a love one for another. And that's at the essence of why we've entitled it Love Never Fails. When we get to uh, chapter number six here, of course, the very first verse says, Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law. Excuse me. Go to deal with this law matter, this civil law matter before the unjust. So last week, remember, we got into contain the controversy. There may be a civil matter that's come up. And that civil matter ought to be dealt with here. Well, they couldn't deal with it. They had to go outside the church. It ought not to be so. Dare any of you take your matter that you have a civil matter and by law, the word of God, following the principles of God's word, by the spirit and the body of Christ, we should be able to work it out. How should a brother or a sister or any family member in the body of Christ have to step outside to the unjust? So we looked at contain the controversy because it was heard about the community of Corinth that they were taking their matters outside which even goes back to chapter number five verse number one we find that fornications commonly reported it's reported commonly which tells me that if it's reported commonly they hadn't dealt with it that it got out in the highways and the byways that get out in the city. They were puffed up about it. They were glorying in it. Again, we looked at that passage of Scripture and we said, hey, we need to handle the tough times because those are tough times because sin hurts everyone in the body of Christ. And those things that 
the world or the outside lost world would hear could put us in a place where they would say, I thought they had a good testimony. I thought they had a good story about them. I thought their message of the gospel of Jesus Christ was real and true, but obviously they have their problems. Yeah, believers have their problems, but we have a different way of taking care of them. We have a forgiving God, a grace-filled God, a just God, the God that here Ben just sung about and we sung together corporately and collectively about there's power in the blood. There's nothing that God cannot take care of. It's our willingness because when he takes care of it, there might be some debt to pay. There might be some things that we'd have to take care of. So here we are in chapter number 6. And we're in chapter number 6 in verses number 12 through 20. And, and so now we're going to get into a place where we say, wow, another tough passage of Scripture. Well, yeah, that's the Bible. Some of it is wonderful. The Bible talks of itself being honey and milk and water. But I tell you, it also talks about being sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, my. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents. It does talk to us clearly by the Spirit who authored it through the men that wrote it before time. So, here we are on a topic that, to me, well, let me just say this. Sexual sin is one of those preaching topics that brings more tension than others. It's not the only one, but it is one that brings more tension than others. And here it is. In chapter number 6, verses 12 through 20, it comes up again. We need to walk through it, just as the civil matters in the earlier part of this chapter, just like the fornication issues and the sexual, sexual sin issues that, of course, we already had to deal with in chapter number 5. You see, the combination of dealing with sexual sin and the incredible doctrine of the Holy Spirit, they deliver us some strong exhortation. It's not that you're just going to point out all the stuff and get the axe out. It's strong exhortation. And yeah, God, when he brings the word and we preach and teach it according to what it's actually says, we're going to preach what it says. This is what the Bible says, and we're going to follow it. If I'm presenting something that I have in a place by the Spirit, then I'll present it to you, and you can decide. I am not going to decide for you the Holy Spirit of God, but I will teach you the truth of the Word of God. That's what I am called to do. I'm not going to add a couple of lines and then line, line upon. I'm going to teach you what it says. And here, uh, this is some tough stuff. Again, it's part of what's going on in the church there in Corinth in 56, 57, 58 AD, after the church just started four years before that. As I've mentioned more than once in our study, they kind of lost their way. The last verse from last, excuse me, last verse we used last week says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Remember this. It says in verse number 9, 10, 11, fornicate oars, adulterers, excuse me, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate abusers. These are the E-R-S's, the O-R-S's. It is a particular trait tied together to an unconverted person by the sin that they have done. It might be a liar, a cheater. Someone gets saved and born again, they will lie and cheat at times, but they're no longer a liar and a cheater before God Almighty. They have been saved, born again, Verse number 11, must I read it again? Yes, I shall. You're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified in yourself. I got you in the name of Jesus Christ. You are washed by him. You are washed by him. You are justified by him. You are sanctified by him when you're born again. If you're not, you're still in that place of an ERS or an ORRS, which is a debtor debtor and the law has condemned us already that's why you can't fulfill it but in Jesus Christ you're born again and now doctrinally speaking 
you are sanctified, justified, and washed, and he sees you. He sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Every sin that you are in an ERS is no longer before the Father's face. By the way, you have the Spirit of God now in you. I mentioned it last week. I also taught it through in our Bible Institute on Wednesday night as we got into 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Consider this. Spiritual circumcision ought to be one of the very early on doctrines that you learn. What happened to me when I'm saved? Salvation is the first lesson in our one-by-one discipleship, doing doctrines and doing life through the doctrines. You need to know this. You see, that old nature is still present, but you're born again. So the old nature lies to us. It will allow the leaven of malice and wickedness to corrupt the spirit of sincerity and truth. You think back to what I just said there a moment ago. There is something very clear about what happens to you when you're saved. But the old nature still lies around and lies to you and to me. And again, the leaven of malice and wickedness, that can corrupt the spirit of sincerity and truth. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 8 from our study two weeks ago. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Here is a picture of what we are partaking in in that feast, the Lord's Supper. It is a picture of when we partake in it, whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. That was spoken of in the church and by Jesus. This is for him and about him. And so it ought not to be that we, picturing our God's bread, for instance, we're the church and we look at that as saying, okay, we're the bread. (laughs) We don't need the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the old nature lies to you and brings it in. And the wickedness to corrupt The spirit of sincerity and truth is easily prevalent. The Holy Spirit of God, he is real. When you think about love never fails, and when you see that up on the screen, you go, yes, I get it. Well, over and over again, I remind you. Remember, by the way, John's gospel, real quick. Just just, 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 just follow me if you want. I'll just give you the references. John chapter number 14. I want to remind you of the Holy Spirit of God in you, believer. Verse number 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. He is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Shall be in you. Day of Pentecost, that's when it gets started with the Holy Spirit being in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Chapter number 15, verse number 26. Jesus' gospel, excuse me, John's gospel, with Jesus speaking in John's account of him sitting with the apostles. But when the comforter is come, 15, 26, whom I send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He will testify of me, Jesus, as the Spirit of truth. Okay, so we have a really important principle here. We have sexual sin that's creeped into the church. It's happened into the believers' lives. We're talking about believers here. The fornication, the sexual sin that Paul is dealing with here and Paul is speaking of really has put them in a place where they're going, how did we get here and what happened to me? How did I get saved, born again? After I I got saved, I I heard that I should be baptized, so I became obedient to the Lord in in scriptural baptism, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the picture of it. I bury you in the likeness of Christ, raise you in the likeness of Christ's resurrection, and and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter number 28, verses 19 and 20. We didn't make that up. This is the Holy Spirit of God that's in you. 
So does God set us free and give us all of that from the bondage of sin that we may ourselves put our chains back on? Is that why God saved us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and gave us the Holy Spirit of God for a new life, being a new creature? Did he set you free from sin so that you would put yourself back into bondage? That we may put ourselves in chains once again? You are free from sin for his pleasure. For his pleasure. To say, I say no to all of that because it's your pleasure that I'm after. Why do I go after the chains of sin that I'm freed from? Well, I have liberty in Christ, and so that really allows me to do everything. The Corinthian church felt that way too. We'll get there in a moment. Let me ask another simple question. Will pursuit of sexual sin bring a spirit-filled life of power and grace in Jesus? No. See, we have been given the opportunity to have a power-filled life, a spirit-filled life over sin, but not just so that everybody can walk around. Excuse me, you can walk around in front of everybody and say, oh, looky, looky me. You have power over sin in Jesus for his holiness. For his holiness. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. And that's something that he desires to do more of, yet we stop him from doing that often. You can sing a song or read a scripture and then Walk away from it and forget what manner of man you are. That's found in James. It's easy to do that. Liberty is not a license. You see, the words of Paul from three chapters ago echo into today's passage of Scripture. It just, it just, just brings us to a place of focusing. We need to focus on the temple of God in us. That's where we're focusing. We're focusing today on, again, this temple, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Back at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. You can turn there. I got it up on the screen. I want you to be reminded of this statement. Remember the context of chapter number 3. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to the church at large. He's mentioning them individually, but he's saying, hey, we're laborers together. We're God's husbandry. We're God's building I had the opportunity to build this as the master builder at your church, the church you have, Corinth. I have laid the foundation, another build it thereon. I left you some good people there, and you were more concerned about a thousand instructors than having a father. I mentioned that later to you. And I said, There's no other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So then I told you, Hey, know ye not? That ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye? Hey, listen. That's pointing to the individual piece and part of us as the temple of the Holy Spirit of God after salvation. But it's also pointing to the church. That's the context of the chapter. He's speaking of us as the church and what we have in him. It's beautiful. Which temple are ye? Which temple are us? It keeps on coming back to individually and personally, yes, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am God's child. As many as received him to them, give me power to be the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's covered in the very first lesson. What happened to you when you got saved? You became a son of God. And nothing you could ever do to earn that or do any works. You were saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you're trying to find your way into heaven by doing a wonderful bit of works, you will end up, after your last breath, hugely disappointed as spending an eternity in hell, a godless hell, without Jesus Christ as Savior because you did not receive the gift the free gift that he paid for, for a propitiation of your sin, the redemption of your soul, the payment 
And then as the Holy Spirit came in in that instant, and from your top of your head to the bottom of your toes, you knew that something supernatural had happened to you at that moment of salvation, even when you were a little kid, you go, whoa, this is incredible. The Holy Spirit is inside of me, and I don't even know who he is. I just know he's God. But somehow along the way, as our text will show us today, we learn how to lie to the Holy Spirit. Thus, our title today, Lying to the Holy Spirit. Because, truth be told from this passage of Scripture, speaking to believers today, sometimes we just really think we can lie to the Holy Spirit within us, lie to the Father in heaven as His Son, Lie to the Savior, the Lord God of glory, the King of kings, and still be okay. You may be okay for a moment, I may be okay for a moment, but boy, my lies stack up to the Holy Spirit until he says, here, let me give you an account this past day or two how you have lied to me, how you have perverted my beauty for you by being contrary to who I am as God in your life. That when I give you conviction and reproof, you turn your back on me and you tell me that you don't need me. That grieves the Holy Spirit of God. That quenches the Holy Spirit of God. And we're very good at seeing everyone else's lies. But oftentimes we're not able to see our own this morning we can relate to the church at Corinth because we're a church. We're all, we, we're, we're the temple of God. We, we, you say, well, this is where you're just coming to this personal because this is your personal problems with all that. No, I'm giving you the text as it is written and I'm preaching and teaching through it so that we can make truly an application to our lives after we get the truth, the historical, the doctrinal, and the inspirational part of this passage of Scripture it means all in totality for us. And it reminds us that the Holy Spirit is called Spirit of Truth. And Paul said, I would have you that you didn't have the leaven of malice and wickedness, but you had the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is what Paul wants for the church at Corinth. This is what the Holy Spirit wants for us. This is what our Savior would have for us. So let's read the passage of Scripture. And then I have four short little lesson points that really, after our introduction, just really support this idea that there's some lies we tell the Holy Spirit, and they come right from here. Because the church here was doing it, and sometimes... We may be doing it as well. Verse number 12, follow along in your Bible, chapter number 6, in the first letter to the Corinthians. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. They had come to a point in their lives where they say, hey, I'm born again, I'm saved, we, we, we are the church, and we don't have to hold on to the law, so all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. I mean, I can pick and choose what I'm going to do. We'll get into that a little bit further. He follows it up with a crazy verse here, verse number 13, but it strikes to the core of how we are when it comes to our flesh, our habits. It says, meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. <laughs> now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He relates the idea of fornication and taking sexual pleasure in the context of marriage, which is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful gift from God. And he says you want to take it and go outside of that because you have an appetite in your lust for that. Just like as if there's meats for your belly, belly for your meats. You have food. You have an appetite. Go ahead and eat. Old Peter the apostle had to deal with that. I wonder if they had Italian sausage over at Cornelius' house. Have you ever wondered about that? 
Gentiles. But even Peter and all of them had to deal with that. Even in the book of Galatia, Galatians, we got that. You say, wait a minute. So, okay, you're a believer in Christ, and so you're free to eat whatever you want, so just be a glutton. What? You see the context of what he's saying? Paul, Paul goes after everything here. The Holy Spirit's doing it. Verse number 14, 15, here we go. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. He's tying that together to the importance of the body to the Lord. It's the Lord's, not yours. To be res resurrected up one day to meet him in the air when we have the soul and the spirit come together with that which is in the grave. But one day the Bible teaches that's a beautiful part of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We'll get to that chapter. We'll have shouting fits all through that chapter. That'll be good. Right now, we're going to the tough parts of the chapters of 1 Corinthians. Verse 15, 16, and 17 look like a package. Let's read them. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Good question. Tough question, but true right there. Of course we are. We know that. Verse, uh, verse number 15, the second question. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid, God forbid that I would do such a thing. Verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. One flesh, when you go with one, and that person, and that fornication, you're one. When you're baptized into Christ, you're one now in Christ and now you're immersed in him, and the spirit now makes you one spirit. Right? Bible. He's bringing it up because he's saying, hey, you and I get stuck up on the flesh so much. Wait a minute. Remember the spirit of God. There's where we're going to get some strong exhortation because the doctrine of the Holy Spirit meets this sexual sin issue in the church. Verse 18, 19, 20. 18, strong verse. A standalone verse, I would say. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. We'll get into that here in a moment. What? Verse number 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's lying to the Holy Spirit lying to the one who is God and glory in you when again you think of what the text is saying in the context of the message here there is some impurity here in this church of Corinth they are a disgraced church they are defiled they have a bad reputation in their community in 58 AD. And Paul's saying, I've got to speak truth to you. I will do it with love. And I want you to know that sometimes you get caught up in some lies to the Holy Spirit. Well, that's where we're at this morning, lying to the Holy Spirit. What I'd like to do is show you four of them. There may be in other places or whatever, but this is the text. So we're going, again, going about it in this format and saying, okay, what are they? What are the ones that you see here, Pastor? What's the Holy Spirit led you to? What's the Word of God say in these verses? The first thing is a statement before a little lesson piece. Ignoring the Holy Spirit's conviction, it leads to the exploitation of the beauty and holiness of the new creature in Christ. You are a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. At the moment of salvation, you're new. When I ignore the Holy Spirit within me and his conviction, it leads me to say, okay, ignore, 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 ignore. Turn off scripture, turn off 
preaching, turn off daily meditation, daily study in the Word of God. I can exploit the beauty and holiness of this. I'm a new creature in Christ. From the inside out, you're a new creature in Christ, believer. If you're not born again today, you are not a new creature. You're still the old creature. You're still the lost creature, and you need to be saved. When you're born again, you become a new creature. Here's lie number one. It says up on the screen, a lax view of our temple doesn't cheapen the Father's handiwork. Remember, this is a lie. Just read that for a moment. Eh, my lax view of the temple of God, it doesn't cheapen the Father's handiwork. Your Father in heaven made you. We sing of it. We say he made us a masterpiece. You reference some beautiful things in the words and the lyric of what you sung today because of Christ. The Father in heaven has something for you and for me every single day that you wake up that's beautiful because he's beautiful. He's righteous, he's glorious, he's holy. It says whatsoever you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I could not do that when I was lost. There was only one person that I lived for to give glory, and that's me. I threw a baseball for my glory. I worked on things for my glory. I wanted the glory and the pat on the back. That flesh still exists, but when I got converted, I realized I'm now the Father's handiwork. You're saying I'm a new creature in Christ? Somebody showed me that verse. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not new. I'm still filthy and dirty. I said, no, no. You've been washed. You've been justified. You've been sanctified. You're new. It's taken years to figure this out through the scripture, but why would I not go after that? Because that's what I want to know and live in is the Father's handiwork. The lie is telling him that I can have a lax view of the temple and it won't cheapen his handiwork. It cheapens his handiwork every single time. I know it. I know it. Because in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. Paul the apostle tells us continually in chapters. You want to have again some great doctrine to learn. Just go home and read Romans 6 and 7 and 8. And you will realize. Grab chapter 5 too. The conversion that you have in Jesus. The brand new life. Now you're at peace with God. And now that peace affords you this beautiful new life. in your temple you need to treat it better than you do, and I need to treat it better. They said, hey, hey, all things are lawful. All things are not expedient. All th- hey, I'm born again. I'm saved. I don't have to worry about nothing. In admitting that all these things were lawful, there were so many things in which you should not indulge. In admitting that they were lawful, a man ought to not be under power with any of them, but yet they chose to do so, and that's what we do. Hey, I'm free. Let me do whatever I want. And then you grab back the chains of the rotten sin that gets in your flesh, even though you're born again, you're saved. We cheapen the Father's handiwork. That fornication stuff was positively wrong, and we know it. And it was against the very essence and the very beauty of the Father's handiwork. That's our first lie. The second one comes by this statement first. Inventing alternatives to God's rules, excuse me, God's laws, simply ignores the spirit of truth in the body who testifies of Jesus Christ. You are the body of the spirit of truth. You're the temple of God. Okay? Spiritually speaking, the Holy Spirit is not matter. Meaning that he's not, that he doesn't matter. He is not a physical entity. He's spirit. He's God and spirit. And he comes into you supernaturally at the moment of salvation. Just like Jesus when he passed through the walls of the gathering place of the apostles and he appeared before them in a transfigured way. He was, oh. How did he do that? Because he wasn't physical matter. This is our Holy Spirit. And see, 
Inventing alternatives to God's laws simply ignores the spirit of truth in the body which testifies of Jesus Christ. What laws do you mean? Like the ones that Paul talks about. There's a law of God. There's a law of sin. There is a law of the flesh. Hey, there's lots of laws. The law of God in the inward man, Romans chapter number 7. Warring against another law in my members, the law of my mind, bringing me to captivity, the law of sin. There are laws in place for the believer to tell you that this is what's going to happen if you go down this road. Why would you want to invent alternatives to God's ways, God's truth, God's love? We do all the time. We become scribes and Pharisees on one side, and on the other side we become licensed people in the liberty in Christ. God has laws in place. Very simple. You're not bound to fulfill the law. You're free in Jesus, but to live God's ways. They're the laws of his righteousness that he imputed upon you. It's a whole different take in life. So law, excuse me, line number two is an immoral life doesn't restrict our surrender unto Christ. I can still surrender to Christ even if I live immoral. Absolutely not. If you're fooling God somehow, some way, God will make sure of that. That's a lie. An immoral life does not restrict my surrender, our surrender unto Christ alone. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. Because you'll never have a sense of being good enough or right enough until you walk away, until I walk away from the things that do restrict and hinder from being surrendered. You cannot have it both ways. I'm surrendered to Christ a little, but I'm not surrendered to Christ a little. You have to be completely surrendered to Jesus Christ, and that will put you in a place where all that junk that you went after in the flesh is no longer important. Will things creep up? Will thoughts come into your mind? Will things visit you? Yes, but there's scripture here. Verse number 15 tells me, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? You're members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And our moral life does stop you from being surrendered to Jesus Christ. Period. It does. Also, now you say, Mr. Perfect, because you're the pastor. I did not say that. I said, when we have a lax view of stuff, when we have an immoral life in our minds and our thoughts, you can't be surrendered to Jesus Christ, too, because you surrender to your flesh. We know. We love this stuff way too much. It's his anyway. He says it's mine. The body's for the Lord. The Lord for the body. It's his. What God can do with this beautiful body, I mean, excuse me, with this awful body. But he's redeemed it and he's made it beautiful from the inside out. I'm a new creature in Christ. You're a new creature in Christ, believers. Why would I want to hinder all that stuff? Thirdly, here's another little lesson thought. Rationalizing like a child. That sexual sin is a moment of weakness, ends up resulting in grown-up consequences. I used an illustration in the first service. I don't have any young people with me. Oh, my kingdom for Mike Curtis. Little, excuse me, Raymond. Oh, I like that Michael. I would get back at him. I said to Raymond, he stood up in the front here. He's a sixth grader, right? Sixth, seventh grader. I said, Raymond, do you like beating up your brothers? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course I do. Do you ever feel bad? No, no, no. I said, have you ever said, I didn't mean to hit him? No. I said, you probably didn't do it until he got hurt and you got in trouble and got a whooping. He said, oh, I didn't mean to hit him then. Oh, yes, you meant to hit him. You just didn't mean to get the consequences. How do we get to a place where we have a moment of weakness? Every one of us are susceptible to that. Don't you ever think that you're better than anyone else? Don't you ever think that you can't be in a place of a moment of weakness? But that moment of weakness will cost you and I 
grown-up circumstances. A child says, I didn't mean to do it, Mommy, I didn't mean to do it. You just broke the TV by throwing a baseball at it. I didn't mean to. You didn't mean for the baseball to break the TV. As a little kid, I've told this story maybe one time. I broke my clarinet over my knee. I got made fun of. I played football on the clarinet. There was a little conflict in my life. <laughs> my parents made me pay for the repair. I had a little savings account. I used to put a, remember the old days you had to had the pass books, the little savings books? How old are we, huh? Anybody going like this? You were born in the 50s and 60s, okay? <laughs> you bring a dollar to the school or whatever or something, and you put it in. I had like $100 in that savings account, and it all was taken. I think the repair was only 30 bucks, and they, they, they made me for 70 but I don't know. Grown-up I mean, grown up consequences. I had a moment of, we moment of weakness. I had a terrible temper. And it finally got the best of me. It was the clarinet's fault that I couldn't play it well, by the way. <laughs> Here's our statement up here, line number three. Very simple. It comes right at it. It's easy to Steve. I'm just going to state it, and here you go. A strong warning statement by God won't really prove true. What's the warning statement in verse number 18? Cheating, lying is not with the body. Fornication is with. A man and a woman come together. They are now together for the consequences. It might have been a childish moment of weakness, but now... It's grown-up consequences. It says there, Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Oh, I don't know. I can get by it. I can get over it. God's forgiveness will be right there. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yes, absolutely. The thing is, you'll never be the same. Before I got saved, I had a, a life that I am not proud of. And I've said a time or two here and there, there's things that haunt me and will haunt me for the rest of my life. And if I don't let the washing of the word of God continually, then I can actually stand up and tell this lie. Yeah. A strong warning statement by God from the word, it's never going to come true. I can tell you every one of them come true. Every one of them. Every proverb that Solomon wrote, every statement that Jesus made in the Sermon on the Mount, everything that's an accounting, he's right on the money. That's a lie. When God gives you a warning, it's going to prove to be true. Someday, Mark, I'll just say it about me. Every one of us. Does that mean that God sits around retributing everything? No. It means that the principles of the word of God are going to come true because those are the laws of the word. There's a law of the flesh. There's a law of the mind. And lastly, here you go. Last statement. That leads to line number four as I finish. Believing that everyone else's more immoral sins is the problem in the church dismisses Jesus' harsh view of Pharisees. Where does that come from? It comes right here. What? Know ye not, verse number 19, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of your own, and ye are not your own? That applies to everyone, not just the people that committed fornication that he's talking to, but everyone in the church. Know ye not? It's back behind, verse number 15, back behind, chapter number 3. It's constantly being told to every believer that the temple of God is what you are to house the Holy Ghost, and that the church, you house the Holy Ghost, and you can't see him, but you know he's present. For ye were bought with a price, therefore glorify God. In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I mentioned this earlier. Believing that everyone else's more immoral sins is the problem? It dismisses Jesus' harsh view of the Pharisees, which they live like this. They said, hey, yeah, I got everything together. 
I don't need that. I don't need this because I'm already much better than everyone else. I'm not a fornicator. I'm not an adulterer. You're right. That's fine. You say well. But you are bought with a price, believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm bought with a price. So all of us, totality, complete every believer in God's kingdom, in the church, in the local ecclesia, every single one of us are bound by this command to glorify God in our bodies and in our spirit because we belong to God. I'm not better than you. None of us are better than anyone else. We are all in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is in you. Here's the lie, a lesser view of our sins. Our sins won't bother the Holy Ghost in us. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Everybody is bound to this truth that we are bought with a price. We're to glorify God in our body. What an incredible example that would be for everybody. So I need to look around and see who's not doing that so that they can get on it. You know, just look at yourself like I look at me. I, I look at me and I go, I need to glorify you, God, in my body, in my spirit. I need to do something about some things in my life. This is the Lord's Supper today before us all. And we enter in with conviction and humility. I know that all of you came in and you were given the elements. And we're going to take the Lord's Supper. I just ask you this. Would you say to the Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee? Do you remember that old song? Would I take my life and let it be consecrated unto the Lord? Would I take my life and say, Lord, you can take my hands, my life, my everything. As we go into the Lord's Supper, I think it's important for us to say, okay, okay. Maybe I need to take an accounting of things. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. I'm going to pray for our invitation time. The music can start now. At that time, if you want to get up and Grab the elements. If you didn't get them when the ushers showed them to you, then they'll help you out. You can get up, and they'll be right there to help you. Um, guys, if you want to grab the basket and stand in the middle, and if they need to, go ahead and come to you for the elements, for the juice and the cracker. While we're praying, if you want to come up here and grab them here, that's fine, and go right back to your chair. And we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we enter this solemn time, we are humbled and with great conviction over Scripture, the Holy Spirit, most of all, Jesus. You bought us with a price. We are not our own. We're here to glorify you in body and in spirit. We love you so very much. As I partake of the Lord's Supper today with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. My prayer is that we would no longer lie to you. That we would see the scripture as truth, the spirit of truth, and we would move upon that. That when we fall down, we come right back to you. When we make a mess out of things, we don't lie about it. We just get it right. And we live by the spirit of truth. You have promised that you will be there. You will never leave us nor forsake us. Whatever burdens we have. You said, Jesus, that your burden is light. Your yoke is easy. We need to take it upon ourselves to let you take things upon you. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for those here. I love them so much. 
and I know you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.